Um, so our next presentation is going to be actually a joint one. Um, and we will have here Mick Riley, who is the Chief Data Officer at Exterior Media, and also Dave Campbell, who's the Principal Data Scientist at TFL. And both of them are going to tell us about how they transformed operational data into revenue for London's transport network. Let us all welcome he them here on stage. Thanks. Hello everyone. Um, my name's uh, Mick Ridley. I'm Chief Data Officer for uh, Exterior Media, and I'm uh, co-presenting with Dale over here, who works for TFL. Do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Hi, uh, I'm Dale Campbell. I work in the TFL Data Science team. Um, we are really focused on using our contactless and Oyster card ticketing data to help understand our customers, and I'll talk about that a little bit. In the sure. way through this presentation. Cheers. So, first thing I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of context around who Exterior Media are. Um, I've been fortunate to be invited uh, to speak at Big Data Week before, so some of you may already know. But I want to give you just a little bit of context about our business, how we work with TFL, um, the challenge that we're faced with, and also the opportunity. Dale's then going to talk to you how that uh, was met by TFL, and then I'm going to come back and talk to you about how we then take all of the data that's being produced and make that into actionable revenue generative um, um, a solution. So just a little bit about Exterior Media. We are the largest privately owned uh, out-of-home media owner in Europe. Uh, we operate in five markets across uh, Europe, so in the UK, the Netherlands, France, Spain, and Ireland. Um, in the UK, we are number one in transport, uh, number two overall. To give you a feel for the scale of it, the, the out-of-home media market is around a billion pound market. Uh, we represent uh, getting on for about 25% of that. The important thing for us is transport is a data-rich uh, environment to operate in. Uh, if you think about roadside media, so roadside billboards, there's no real way of understanding the audiences that you're engaging with, the audiences that are engaging with the assets and the advertising messages that they're seeing. In transport, that's very different because you're leaving behind a data trail when you're tapping in, you're tapping out, you have a ticket. That gives us a little bit of an understanding about who's seeing what and when. And that is a real opportunity for us. Um, in terms of the way that we work with TFL, uh, we um, won the um, eight and a half year contract to work with TFL to monetize the advertising estate on the London Rail estate. Um, to give you an idea of the uh, size of that, it's the largest advertising contract of its kind in the world. Uh, over the eight and a half year period, it will generate in excess of two billion pounds of revenues. Uh, to put that into context again, that is the largest single source of non-fair revenue for TFL. And as TFL becomes a self-funding organisation, you can understand how incredibly important that is. What we're offering advertisers is the opportunity to engage with audiences as they pass through the London Underground Network across over 400 stations. There are 1.3 billion passengers a year that travel through it. Now, the Hello London partnership is very much based on that principle. It is a partnership. And one of the key principles is around data and insights, the opportunity to work with TfL to use the data that they generate to help us sell the medium better by informing advertisers about the audiences that they can uh, communicate with. Secondly, it's about a world-class estate, and I'll talk a little bit about the world-class estate that we're putting in over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And then lastly, partnerships, so partnership between our two organisations, but also partnerships with brands and clients in terms of how they can use all of that estate uh, for the benefit. So, in terms of our rollout over the next uh, few years, it is very much digitally focused. So, you know, traditionally out of home has been a paper and paste kind of uh, medium. You put up a poster for two weeks, it then comes down, another poster goes up. Over the last few years, and I'll show you the revenues in a second, that has shifted towards digital screens. So from our point of view, we are investing tens of, million of millions of pounds over the next couple of years. Uh, across uh, sort of four key kind of formats. We have DX3 in the top left there. Um, so that's uh, a cross-track projection uh, system, so allowing full motion video for people on platform. Secondly, we have something called D12s, which are landscape screens, which you'll see in uh, kind of high dwell time environments in the ticket halls. Uh, video walls and digital sixes, so they are uh, landscape formats. Uh, 
uh, sorry, portrait formats rather, uh, and there'll be sort of 400 of those rolling across the network. And lastly, and it says video wall and D6 again there, digital ribbons. So these are, these are very exciting. Advertisers love the idea of this. This is rather than having individual screens as you're going down an escalator, this is one continuous screen that stretches the entire length of an escalator. So as a creative canvas, it's absolutely fantastic for clients to be able to work with. And on top of all that, we have the Elizabeth line launching at the end of 2018, which, as you can imagine, is going to fundamentally change the way that Londoners move across the city. Again, key for us to understand how that is going to change the way that people move. So I mentioned about out of home moving towards digital screens. So this is just a, a demonstration of how this is happening. So in 2011, only 14% of uh, out of home revenues were spent on digital advertising assets. By H1 2017, we're seeing 44%, and actually by the end of the year, that will be 50%. So you can understand how important this is becoming to the industry. But because of that, we need to have data. And that's because we're in an increasingly digital world. The way that people consume media is now online, on their mobile, and clients have an expectation about what they're going to receive back in terms of their media buys, the kind of information that they receive. It's about moving away from thinking about an advertising asset to an audience. You're selling an audience to a client. You're telling them about who is engaging with their message, when they're engaging with it. So it's about being accountable. It's about providing flexibility. So rather than this two-week posting cycle that I talked about earlier, it's actually being able to understand when, where, and in what context I should be able to put up messaging and using those assets to their full extent. Providing effectiveness back to clients, so telling them how effective their advertising has been, what is the behavioural change that they've seen through that advertising. And this is really changing the way that we plan, buy and sell in the marketplace. So again, rather than selling a package of frames, I'm selling an audience. Now, there's a huge opportunity with working with Transport for London. If you think about the London Underground Network, it is a closed network environment. You tap in, you tap out, and you've only got one purpose for that journey, and it is that journey. Now, for us, to be able to have access to that data is absolutely critical. So the challenge and the opportunity is how can we utilise this operational data to best commercial effect? And now I'm going to hand over to Dale, who's going to talk to you a little bit about how we've done that. So no pressure then. It's quite easy, this. It's really exciting, isn't it? These opportunities presented by all this kind of interaction with our audiences and the data that we can use to interact with them. Uh, so as I said, thank you, Mick, for that uh, introduction. So I'm going to just take you through some of the information that we have available to us here at TFL and then just kind of build on this picture, that, the story that we built in about how we use that data to help our partners. So we see around 12 million customers every month. And those customers are making around 19 million taps at gate lines and on buses and on trams every day. And they're making them at 700 stations and around 19,000 bus stops. So there's a huge amount of information. You can imagine that. How we collected all of that in. And of course, how can we use this data to better understand our customers? How can we understand how they're using their stations at different times of day, which stops they're using, and how they're interacting with our network? What is the demand that they're putting onto our system? So we need to build customer insight. We need to create something that we can take action upon. And so this is our kind of flow about how we go from taps that happen on the network all independently and we bring them together to start to understand the behavior that cards make. So we start looking at things like favorite home station, favorite home bus stop, the time that they typically start at through the day. Um, you know, what's their favorite product? What do they like to use? Do they have a monthly travel card or do they pay, use pay as you go? And of course, these kind of really basic card behaviors form the building blocks to understand much more about our customers so we can understand what kind of customer they are? What's their kind of pattern of travel? What kind of groups do they belong to? And do they have characteristics that are common within them? And of course, once we build these types of variables, that allows us to create actionable insight. This intelligence over here in the car behavior allows us to make really good decisions about our customers. So, like where and when should I run a travel demand campaign? You know, when should I tell people not to travel at certain locations or to travel on different routes in our network that are less utilized? How will customers be affected by a plan closure? We have closures all the time. We want to give our customers the best information to hand so they can make the best choices for themselves. And of course, in a commercial operating, what is best suited to this station? And this is where we link in with our partner, Exterion. So 
One of the things that we're looking to do to build on the information that we know about our customers is to link to data sources and data sets that typically aren't ours. And this example here is about using mosaic segmentation. We're using the mosaic public sector, uh, public sector segmentation, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, but it's a geographic, a geodemographic segmentation of customers by postcode. So it's looking at attributes such as household income, car ownership, household type, family structure, those kind of things. And they create 66 types. And those 66 types of mosaics that they're grouped by postcode are then grouped into 15 summary groups, which are over here on the right-hand side of this presentation. So we're using mosaic types here to understand our customers and the card behavior. And this is a very high-level flowchart, and that's very basic. There's a lot of work happening underneath this um, as to how we start to bring those mosaic types to the attributes that we defined earlier in our insight engine. So we have 3 million customers that are registered with us. Those customers give us a postcode. Now, of course, not all that great is brilliant. You know, some people put really dodgy postcodes in there. We clean those postcodes up. We're then able to link those postcodes to the mosaic data that I spoke to previously because it's all grouped by postcodes. We then, I'll just bring you to this, we then take those registered users and we identify them against their favorite station. And we say, these groups of customers at these favorite station have this distribution of mosaic types. Now we've still got 75% of our users of the 12 million that we identified in traveling in a month without a mosaic type. So then we have to assign them to a mosaic type. And what we do is we assign them to the distribution of mosaic types for that home station. So we're not trying to associate them to a postcode or to a location. We take the distribution of the mosaic types at that station for the registered users, and then we apply it as a distribution for that customer, uh, for that card, rather, sorry. Now, we're not interested in cards. We're not interested in what well, we're interested in groups of people. So we take those mosaic types and we group them up and we look at all their taps. And we look at where they're traveling. And by linking all those taps together, we can start to see what the distribution of mosaic types are at a certain station, at a certain time of day, and which direction they're going. So this is a typical bit of output that we would give to Exterior when we aggregate our count data. So we're not sending anything. It's all anonymized, depersonalized data that we're sending out. We provide it to uh, Exterior, and we can start to say, at this time of day, this type of group, we're, this many number, we're entering or exiting at any time of day. And we start to do that for every day of the week. And of course, this applies to all the London Underground stations that we have on the network. I'll hand back and okay. up to Mick, and he'll tell us how he uses it. OK. So what I want to do now is I've got some visualizations of how we look at the data. Now, they're not pretty. I want to set the bar quite low for when I flick onto the next slide. But the important thing is, as, as Dale says, we are provided with this data now on a weekly basis. So what that gives us the opportunity to do is understand at a station level, at a 15 minute time increment, who is in a station at any one particular point in time, or the groups of people that are in station at any one particular point in time. So I'm going to take you through some visuals, uh, and then I'll just talk through why this is important to us and how we're going to use it. So shield your eyes, it's going to be awful. <gasps> So what we've done is uh, we received this data. It's actually very simple data. It's, if you think about it, it's a station, a time, and then the mosaic types and the volumes that we see entering or exiting the system. So it's long and thin, if you like. It's 21 million records I think we receive on a, on a, on a weekly basis. Now, we've just popped this into, this is ClickSense. Uh, we've just popped it into ClickSense, and we've just sort of very simply visualized it. So on my left-hand side here, I've got my volumes that I'm seeing. So this is over a one-week period, so week commencing the 31st of July. I've got my, my volumes by station. Here, you'll see what, how I use this in a second, but this is showing a, a percentage profile, depending on what I select. I've then got my mosaic groups and my mosaic types, my volumes by day of week, and then my 15-minute time increments. So giving me very basic information about how the network is operating over this one-week period. So in total, and we're only looking at where we have assets that are available to advertisers to advertise on, we've got just under 50 million tap-ins and tap-outs, which is 100% of the network. And very simply, I've got proportionately the mosaic profile that I'm seeing for, um, for the network. Now, what we can start to do is start to drill down and understand how does the station environment change 
during the course of a day or during uh, a comparative between two days and two times. Now, if you think, if I'm an advertiser and I'm working on a, sort of a, a digital campaign using a digital screen, it's important for me to make sure, one, I'm communicating with the right, uh, uh, the right audience and that I'm in the right place at the right time. So what I'm comparing here is Bond Street on Wednesday the 2nd at 7 a.m., and Bond Street on Sunday at 4 p.m. So very different times of the day and day of the week. So what I can see on Wednesday at 7 a.m. is I've got actually quite a lot of um, probably less affluent groups using that station. I've got cultural comfort. Uh, I can't read it because it's so pixelated. You're just going to have to trust me. It's quite, they're quite not, not quite so affluent. So I think what you're seeing there moving through that station is probably, uh, uh, probably support workers. It might be cleaners going home. Those types of people are passing through that station at that time. So from a client perspective, our client's perspective, it's important that the right brand is put up or the right message is put up to those people passing through the station. If we then look at 4 p.m. on a Sunday, you can imagine it's the, you know, the end of a busy trading day in Bond Street, we're seeing quite a huge change in the way that this uh, audience is made up. It's suddenly now very affluent. This uh, city prosperity has jumped from, I think, about 24% to 35%. They're the most affluent group of mosaic types. So again, that would suggest that you're probably going to want a, a, an, all, a, an advertiser that is going to want to communicate with a more affluent group. So you can see how that's changing just by comparing just these two times for this one station. But actually, the way that we really want to look at it is I'm an advertiser. I have a segmentation that I've created. I want to see where is the most efficient place to target those audiences. So what we're looking at here, I've now selected my city prosperity group. And this is now indicating to me that I have nearly 32% of my tap-ins and tap-outs are made by this one single group. What this chart is now showing me, so before it was just showing 100%, is now which stations over-deliver against that particular audience. So if I want to target this city prosperity group, I should be looking at East Putney, Turnham Green, Clapham South, Highgate, and so on and so forth. If I want to target them in volume, on the left-hand side, it should be Oxford Circus, King's Cross, Victoria, and so on and so forth. So what this is allowing me to do is to start to build a campaign on behalf of my client. Now, let's pretend that I'm an upmarket kebab shop. I want to know, on a, it says Saturday, but it's actually like early hours of Saturday morning, so Friday night, if you like, I want to target City Prosperity, but I want to target them as they're going home from their fantastic night out, so at midnight, one o'clock and two in the morning. Where should I do it? Now, what you can see is my volume stations have changed. It's now Leicester Square, Brixton, King's Cross, St Pancras, people getting the train home, that would be me. Not necessarily in the A group, I have to add. Uh, Liverpool Street and so on and so forth. But then also, from an efficiency point of view, totally different set of stations now. It's Clapham Common, Clapham North, South Wimbledon, Northfields. So again, using my digital assets, and I'll go on to my next page, because now what I can see here is, of those stations that are delivering me that efficiency, I can now select the asset types that I have available in that station. So I've selected here DEPs, which are digital escalator panels, and LCD screens. So again, using that, that digital asset to communicate with those people at that point in time, they might have slightly blurry vision, I don't know, hopefully not, but there you go. So what we can now see is where those assets are and how I can communicate with them. So for us, this is absolutely invaluable information. So just to put it into, uh, I keep using the word context, so I do apologise. Putting it into context, the way that we measure out of home currently is based on modelled data. So we have a, uh, a currency called Root. Root is generated on people holding a GPS meter, 30,000 people nationally for a 14-day period, and then that's modelled up to the rest of the, the UK. Um, when you look at just the London Underground on its own, that gets down to a sample size of 2,000 people. It's modelled and it's fixed, so it doesn't tell us all of the nuances about what is going on in the station environment. The other thing it doesn't tell us about is, well, when there's disruption on the network or when there's an event, how does our audience change? You can imagine the audience at Wimbledon when Wimbledon is on, is very different to the day-to-day -day audience that you see for the, the remaining 50 weeks of the year. So all of this is hugely valuable insight. And what it allows us to do is change the way that we sell our assets. So we can be much more flexible about it. So at the moment, and what we're changing is that we sell broadcast packs. The power of out-of-home is it is a broadcast medium. But we can start to make it much more targeted. Not one-to-one, -one, it's still a one-to-many medium, but we can just start to put all of this data into place to, for example, make sector-specific packs. So what I talk about there is 
we want to generate a pack that is specifically for the car buying audience or for the fashion audience or the finance audience. So slightly generic, but we become more targeted. Audience specific packs, which is where I'm just taking a segmentation that a, a, a client has provided us with, and we can then generate one, something that is, is um, appropriate to that audience. Portfolio client packs, so that's where I'm a big brand, I'm a Unilever, a Procter & Gamble. I've got lots and lots of different brands that I want to activate during the course of the year. What we can start to think about is, right, I can create the Dove pack, the Lynx pack, the Marmite pack, the, the, the Purcell pack, and then the buyer can then just activate it whenever he wants. So we're giving much more flexibility to the client. And then lastly, this bespoke client pack. So this is where we are getting down to it's an individual site that a client wants to pick. And obviously you can imagine the more flexible we get, the more the premium that we can charge. So the better the revenues that we can generate on behalf of Exterior and TfL. So just sort of to sum up, I think, you know, we have entered into a partnership with TfL. It is clear that a collaborative approach is the way to sort of move these kind of relationships forward. If we didn't have that collaborative approach, you know, when I joined the business about three years ago with TfL, we kind of received some data occasionally and it was very volumetric. It wasn't really particularly useful. But the reason that we're now getting this data is because there is a clear commercial generative use case behind it. And I think that's very important. I think, you know, that, that's, I've noticed that as a theme in the last couple of talks is that, you know, you've got to think about what the use case is. You've got to have, what, what's the question that you want to answer and what's the benefit of doing it before you even start? Um, also, I think importantly, we should add this, all of this revenue is generated, is invested back into the network. So there is a customer benefit by doing this. We would also say that, you know, it gives people better journeys because they're seeing stuff that is more relevant to them. They're not seeing irrelevant stuff. We're not targeting you one-to-one, -one, but we are targeting the, the, the group in terms of the messaging that we want to get across from advertisers. And also, as Dale you know, sort of spoke about earlier, it also has uses just beyond this revenue generative uh, uh, use case. It's around station management and planning, retail planning, for example. You know, there's a huge um, uh, retail proposition that TfL have. This data can feed into that. It can start to inform which are the right retailers to have at certain stations. So, you know, overall, I think, you know, it's, it's very exciting for me. I've, so I've been speaking here now, this is my third time, and we've sort of been going through a journey. I, I, the first year was uh, our partnership with Telefonica, using Telefonica data to help us understand the London Underground Network. Last year, we had a panel, and we had uh, a TfL with us there, starting to talk about, well, we're in a partnership now. How are we going to use this data? And now we're able to tell you this is how we're doing it. So, you know, for me, this is fantastic. I think, you know, it's, it's a real you know, exciting story, I think. Thank you. Thank you, gents. Um, logically winding this scenario forward, X months or years, ideally, you could do all this stuff real time, right? Correct. Uh, um, so, a, uh, are there plans afoot to do it? Do TfL already capture this stuff real time with Storm or Spark or anything like that? And can you tell us a bit about the tools involved? Um, so absolutely, there is obviously absolute ambitions to do things in real time. Um, maybe not linked to our commercial relationships, but more linked to our, our tactical planning when we're supporting staff in stations, customers during disruption. There's a real appetite to help our customers through real time. Uh, so we do collect information and we do feed that out to our operational sides. Uh, in terms of this relationship here, it's about what is the best way in which to lever leverage that information. We haven't, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, we haven't had those discussions because what we're trying to do is understand how this benefits us first and then move iteratively forward from there as opposed to trying to, let's try and rush there now and see what it looks like. We're trying to move forward and I think as a business, as partners, we're working together to understand how we best get there. But you know, real time for us is a really important around supporting our customers and our, our, our staff in getting their journeys complete, really. That's our primary focus, and we focus on that. What was that? Question down here. Yeah. Um, so I have a question regarding, I mean, I think your partnership is very interesting, but it seems to stop at the moment where uh, you've brought the right content, the right brand, to probably the right audience. What happens after that? Now, following on from that question, 
I guess a lot of people are using their contactless cards now. Can you track purchases of, say, that product um, that they've seen in their journey to, um, to the ads that they've seen um, on there? Or okay, those yeah, so the, yeah, so there's two sides to that. I think there's a accountability piece. So again, providing this data allows us to prove to our clients we have delivered what we said we would deliver. Yeah. So again, you know, if we are targeting a certain audience, we've chosen certain stations, the following week, because it is on a weekly feed currently, we can prove that that has actually happened and then we've hit the metrics that we want to. With regards to payment card data, yes, there is potentially an opportunity in the future to do that. Uh, and it's certainly something that we are exploring because ultimately, you know, an advertiser advertises for a behavioral outcome, whether that be, it doesn't necessarily always have to be a purchase, it's about brand consideration and all of those kind of things. But if it is about increasing my, my sales, then obviously trying to link that back to a card that has potentially been exposed to that messaging is obviously something of interest to us, but it's down the line. Yeah, yeah, it's really important. I think, I mean, I, we literally said right at the beginning, what we're dealing with here is aggregate account data. This is personal information which we, we don't, we, which we don't want to engage with. We're trying to separate that and create the aspect of, uh, of it so that we are working with account data, we're working with groups of people because it's really important to us as an organization, being the public sector organization we are, that it's about our reputation here. We want our customers to feel safe and trusted we're using our network. So it's a very careful thing, but you're absolutely right. You know, we have to look to these and see what's acceptable, but that's not, certainly not on the roadmap just yet, though, no. I would say. <laughs> I need the microphone to come closer. Um, a comment and uh, then a question. I've actually seen worse visualisations, so you didn't need to... <laughs> um, question, and I think it follows on from the lady's question just now. Can you just touch on the ethical considerations of putting, giving access, pri private advertisers access to the public in a, what is for all intents and purposes a public space, all enabled by some pretty impressive analytics to target that in a quite a unique way? Um, I'm not sure I really understand the question. Could you possibly just, what, are you, what is your concern? Just, I mean, so, I understand the ethical aspect. I'm just trying to get to your concern, sorry. So um, I come from a financial services background and we yep. spend quite a lot of time on conduct risk and thinking about which products should be sold to which customers in oh, which okay. way. Um, and I'm just wondering as a public sector utility, Sure. Giving access to private individuals in, with quite targeted analytics. What, if we just take so, the kebab example, no, I think should, should we be actually nudging those people to maybe go and get a healthy meal instead of a yeah. kebab at three that's, in the morning? That's a very good point. I think was, this is a relationship that we as an organization, we work together on. And I think you may have seen things in the past about advertising campaigns that have existed on our network, which we've stopped because of that. So we take that very important, you know, TFL considers that really heavily. And it's really important that we do work in a very ethical way. So I think you'll know, I can't remember the exact names of the campaign, but the issues around body shaming and things like that, which we take really, really, uh, give you a lot of consideration to and take really important needs. And it's about us working together and understanding what is going to go out onto the estate and then understanding what are the kind of things that we can accept and we can't. So it is really important to us. So does that kind of help you answer your question? So we do consider it, but it's, it's done in unison as opposed mm -hmm. to a, we're, he's, we're exterior, I'm not giving data to somebody else. That we're, no. they're, somebody's coming to them, and then we work together to understand what's going out. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah? yeah. No, I'm just about to Thank you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so again, I think, you know, the whole point of the data we are getting is aggregated. There is no personally identifiable information. And in fact, we're not interested in that personally identifiable, personally identifiable information. Out of home is a broadcast medium. It is not about targeting you as an individual. It is about targeting groups of people. Otherwise, if you think about the cost of putting a, an ad up on a, on, a, on, a, on a site or on a screen, it would become prohibitive if I'm just talking to you. So if you think of the, the minority, of, and I hate minority report for this, but everybody <laughs> always goes immediately to minority report and it's gonna be, I'm gonna be walking through and I'm gonna get that Guinness ad and that Guinness ad is just for me. That is not the way it works. Economically, it's not possible for that to happen. It's about understanding the crowd in aggregate. So 
in terms of the way that we work with TfL, you know, from, from my perspective, from, from my organisation's perspective, I do not want any personally identifiable information coming into my organisation because for me, that's a huge risk and it's actually something that is not of interest. We're not interested in retargeting, we're not interested in looking at you as an individual. So I'm happy yeah. ethically that we are doing the right thing in the terms of the way that we work with TfL. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a gentleman over here who's also had his hand up for a while. <laughs> Hi. Um, there's a question really just uh, understanding whether TfL are using the same data in other areas of the business, uh, security concerns uh, or traffic flows to improve the service as well, and whether you're separating it out at a technical level, because we heard some other work streams saying sometimes it's okay to keep it in the same place, sometimes it's better to keep it separated. Um, I'll just try, I'm, I may need to come back to you just to clarify some of the, your question. So absolutely, we use this information here for our own business, inside our business to help support our business make decisions, whether it's during disruptions or whether that's for short to long-term planning, we use the information that we collect and the car, like for instance, the car behavior to understand how we support that. So as I alluded to before, you know, in terms of our tactical planning for say a campaign where we tell customers that this station is busy at 8.15 in the morning, that information that we have that kind of segments them out allows us to think about our communication strategy, about the language we might use that might be received, the kind of in-station announcements as opposed to our signage announcements and also our broadcast media, for instance. You know, how do we set it out in the, uh, the, the Metro page, for instance? What are the kind of information we have and how do we communicate it? So absolutely, we use this type of information, maybe not possibly the mosaic type because we, they're a slightly different group for our requirements, but in terms of understanding if they're a commuter or if they're a visitor, if they use the system occasionally, that's the kind of information we use to know whether we should target our messaging differently or our channels differently or tell our staff that you're going to get a lot of people who are visitors. They don't know the system that well. So you're going to need people there to talk to them. So you absolutely, we use that information. Finally. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this gentleman have, and then I might catch you later if you want to, if you want, yeah. Sure. Um, so my question is, TFL do publish some, some of the data openly. Correct. Using unified API. Yes, we do. Um, but I think the Oyster cards and contactless is one which is not even published, like even if it's aggregated, it's not being published openly. Mm -hmm. So is there a plan for do doing that for the developers working on applications and stuff? So we always, we, we're very, we, we are completely bought into open data. Mm -hmm. And yes, we are always considering what we can bring to the open data, to the open API out to allow that. We have to be very careful because we are using, for instance, with our partners here, working with data that we may not want to just share openly because it helps us make a better partnership. And if that data was just freely available, that would kind of cause some constraints and issues. But yes, we are always trying to look to what information can we give out in an open data way. Now, I can't tell you what they are because I don't see the whole roadmap. But yes, we are certainly looking to see what kind of contactless or Oyster card data we might provide, but it's about the level of aggregation at which we provide it. As we've constantly said throughout this, it's not about, it's about creating groups and, and thinking about ensuring that there's no data issues, there's no protection issues. You know, and for instance, if we were to provide something, like what kind of level do we provide it at? Do we run it up to 10 when there's everybody less than 10 at a certain location at a certain time? Those kind of questions still need to be worked through. And it's really important that we consider them now because of course, we, I think most of us are aware of GDPR coming down the road. And that's really critical that us as an organization, we cannot expose ourselves to anything which contravenes that set of regulation that we're coming through. So yes, we are looking at it, but I can't tell you what it is today. Thank you. Sure. So I do realize that we're holding up people for lunch. So yeah. Any last questions? Yeah, I don't know. It's up to the organizers. I'm not. I'm happy to stay for another couple of questions. Oh, do we have one question? There's a man in the back there. Uh, have you considered or are you considering uh, using the same data to stream uh, content straight to the device? Is that practical? For streaming? Or hardware straight to the device instead of connecting the I'm not sh sure I understand. Sorry. Could Okay, uh, I meant, have you uh, considered or are you considering using TFL data in your campaign to, instead of for example, putting an advert on the board, you stream it straight to the mobile phone. Is that practical? Not, it's certainly not in our roadmap, no. I mean, at the moment, it's around digital screens and using those screens. Again, you're into a different sort of space there, and it's TfL's own infrastructure. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time, guys.